So I'm going to, uh, for the last time, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, probably not. I'm just as happy to not use the gavel. Uh, all right. So a few uh, meeting logistics. Uh, so uh, if you're joining the meeting remotely, if you would change your name to your first and last name so I can call on you um, appropriately. Uh, when you speak, uh, if you have comments to make, if, um, by the way, if we could, if we have conversations going on out in the crowd, if we could take them outside, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, when you speak, uh, if you could say your name and where you live, that would be very helpful. Um, uh, we recommend, or we're asking folks to keep their comments to, uh, two minutes or less. And Donna over here will help us with the time. Uh, and if you are speaking on any um, item, if you could keep it uh, germane to the um, to the topic at hand, that'd be great. Uh, and if you wish to be if you wish to speak, if you could uh, just wait to be recognized by by me, that would also be good. Uh, I think that is it. Um, so uh, we're going to check in on the agenda. I don't have any information about changing the agenda. Um, anyone else have information to suggest that we ought to change the agenda? Nope. Okay, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so we are on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to make a comment on any item that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and But I, I, as I understand it, there may be some folks who would like to make some comments about items in our agenda that are later and would prefer to speak now to them so they don't have to stick around to later items. And that's okay. That's fine with me. Um, so if that describes you, um, that's that's okay. And now is the time. So uh, we'll start with folks in person. Um, anyone wish to make a comment? My name is Annika Turcott. I'm a Montpelier citizen and a student um, A student at Montpelier High School. I've known Merrick Moden for about three years now as a classmate and a friend. Um, so, yeah. Over the summer, Merrick made it his goal to go door to door every day. He knocked on hundreds of doors around town. And when residents answered, he wanted to have a conversation with them. I remember this one time we were on a um, couple's porch for an hour as they described their struggles um, on a fixed income and the rising cost of living in our town. He's he terrible. Carefully. Um, and tonight is his chance to really take all those stories and all the people he's talked to and turn that into political action. I can say with absolute confidence that he is wise beyond his years and will be a great fit for city council. Merrick is as thoughtful as he is passionate and has served us well as a representative on the school board. He follows the ongoings of our town out of pure interest and because he cares deeply about his constituents. Youth voice in our government is incredibly important. And if 16% of our population is aged 18 or younger, we should see that uh, in our representation. I think I speak for most youth in Montpelier when I say we trust him to advocate on our behalf. And I really hope the council will seriously consider his appointment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else uh, with us in person? Good evening, and I'm sure I will run over two minutes um, because I'm exercising my constitutional right to be heard and to hold public officials accountable, uh, which is the purpose of this portion of the public meeting. I say, God save our city. Uh, and it's a good send off. I believe this is your last meeting, isn't it? Or will there be another? You could tell me. Um, I want to point out some of the examples of good governance versus autocracy. Uh, last year, the budget hearings, when I announced, you know, that I would run for mayor, the it was a done deal. You weren't going to already vote the budget. We're just going through the motions to hear from the public. I don't know why we have echo. I can't. <laughs> Um, so it was a, it was a done deal. It was a preordained, the, the, the facade of public participation that we do here, uh, it doesn't amount to much of anything. When I talk to many people on the streets, people I've never met, 
they don't bother coming to city council to express their they feel that it's a it's a rigged system that it won't have any effect that they're not heard that it's a waste of time uh that's a problem that's a deep problem the division i warned you about back in the garage era uh is is still deep there are you know merchants who resent anyone who spoke out about the garage to the point of perjuring themselves about it so Years, three and a half years since the Homelessness Task Force was created, we still don't have warming places uh, available round the clock. We don't have cooling places in the summer. We don't have toilets. We've got city-owned toilets in City Hall and in the transit center that we don't allow people to use in at any hour they need to go. Uh, just last week, the example of uh, asking, speaking up about the MOU with Green Mountain Transit, and Jack speaks to Bill, and he's like, "Oh, that's federal funds, so if it's not transit related, no pushback at all." Well, if you ever stop to think about it, the unhoused are always in transit. There's no way you would get shut down from the feds from using our transit center as a place where the unhoused could use the bathroom. That's just absurd. But yet, there's no will to push back against that kind of mendacious mismanagement. Um, I'm almost making better time than I thought. Missing public records. I've raised issues with you about records related to the conditions for city center bathrooms on the permit for city center. The PSAP, when Montpelier decided not to be a PSAP. Uh, body cams, when you were assured it was going to be another opportunity to speak on it, and you rammed it through on the consent agenda uh, with the missing proposal of body cams and, and, and uh, tasers that was presented. Uh, and most recently, written correspondence with the police chief about unprofessional conduct, and he can't find it. How convenient. You know, it's like, and no one cares that your appointees, your staff, are destroying public records, that's a crime. And you just like sweep it under the rug like you did the, the shooting, the dispatch error that led to Mark Johnson's death. So I'm pointing, oh, we, we accomplished lockers, lockers that are too small for anybody to put a backpack or a, a sleeping bag in. So have you ever stopped to assess whether you're, you know, just going through the motions and playing a game and maintaining the status quo instead of solving these problems that have been brought before you year after year after year. There's still a foot over a foot of snow in many of the parking spaces, even on state, on Elm, on Maine. And that snow stopped fl flying last Friday or Saturday morning, you know? And yet we're going to still charge people and tow them and ticket them for parking on alternate sides of the streets. Anybody else who collects the money for the tickets, for the meters, for the taxes, and then doesn't deliver, that's called fraud. You're charging for something and not delivering. So wake up, you know, wake up and, and, and take your job seriously. Thank you. Anyone else with us in person wish to make a comment? Yes. I'm Dan Toll uh, from uh, First Avenue. And first, I just want to thank Steve for his comments in support of uh, among the most vulnerable and deserving uh, in our uh, in, in our great city. But I'm not here wearing my Homelessness Task Force consulting hat. I'm here wearing a number of other hats. I'm wearing I'm here to wearing my Montpelier Police Review Committee hat. I'm here wearing my citizen of Montpelier and Washington County hat. I'm here wearing my hat as a psychiatric survivor and as a, uh, someone with a, a major mental health condition who is out supporting people who have mental health issues, including people who have been traumatized by interactions with uh, on the street in, in crisis. I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to say a lot. But I'm going to urge you not to cut the funding for the embedded social worker. The police review committee, which both Jack and Lauren were part of, we recommended adding one and a half FTEs in terms of a crisis, a mental health crisis response workers, either social worker or even better, 
peer support crisis worker. And we recommended adding one and a half and the, and the council agreed ultimately to add a half an FTE. We already had the embedded social worker, as you all know, that we were sharing with Barry. So we were, we were paying for, for half of that individual. What I understand you're going to be talking about later tonight is not only roll, uh, not only rolling back what the police committee had recommended, additional mental health crisis specialists, but moving backward, pulling funding from a program that we had in place, which was moving the city, moving the county towards getting the right types of resources to deal with crisis. You know, law enforcement is absolutely the right, the right response if you have a crime or violence. But as we all know, most of the situations, the crises in the street, don't involve criminality. They don't involve violence. Um, mental health, and we all also, I think we're all well aware, all across the country, cities, municipalities, counties are, are implementing bringing additional mental health resources to crisis response. So I'd urge you, please, don't cut the funding. I know it's been very hard finding someone to fill that position, but in my humble opinion, and all due respect, difficulty finding, filling a very vital role is not a reason to cut the funding. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else with us in person wish to make a comment? Hi, thanks. Um, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of Palin Cohen, who's running for the District 2 seat. So I'll say my piece now and then I understand that will happen later in the evening. But thank you for allowing um, time to speak on behalf of the candidates tonight. My name is Eva Zaret and I live in Plainfield or maybe Marshfield, depending on who you're asking. Um, <laughs> I'm here tonight to speak in strong support of Palin Cohn, who's seeking appointment to the District 2 Council position of the Montpelier City Council. You have already reviewed Palin's resume and cover letter, so you're already aware of her impressive personal and professional accomplishments. So what I want to do is take this time to speak to her character in order to further illustrate why she's the right candidate for this seat. Palin and I were both fellows with the New Leaders Council program. Early on in the program, she identified her goal to run for Montpelier City Council in order to serve her new community. She systematically mapped out her plan to achieve that goal, including identifying the obstacles, and then set out to tackle each one. Most notably, in some ways, she would need to become a U.S. citizen in order to be eligible. After studying for with the help of her children, she passed her U.S. citizenship test in May 2022 a test that I learned only 36% of Americans would pass, by the way, and I'm so pleased to see her accomplishing this next step of the journey. This tenacity, along with her progressive values and logical thinking, will serve the council well. As a new American, <laughs> as a new American, Palin consistently brings a unique perspective to every conversation. I'm often I often have found myself reflecting on her statements long after the conversation has ended, wondering, why didn't I think of that? It is her commitment to inclusion, driven in part by her own immigration story, that will help keep Montpelier, the capital of our state, a welcoming and inclusive place as demographics shift. Lastly, Palin is inherently collaborative. Even when expressing a differing opinion, she does so in a way that builds relationships and fosters constructive dialogue. Working on projects with her was easy and enjoyable, characteristics that I know will be welcome on the council. In summary, Palin is a driven, forward-thinking, and collaborative leader who is the right choice for the seat. I appreciate the time to speak on her behalf, and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Eva Zaret. All right. Thank you. Anyone else in person wish to make a comment? Okay. So we'll go to the uh, folks with us digitally. Uh, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Peter Kelman. I live on Mountain View Street in Montpelier. Uh, under item 12 on tonight's agenda, the council is going to be considering the applications of Merrick Moden and Pellon Cohn to fill Connor Casey's District 2 council position. 
to serve from the time of Connor's resignation at the conclusion of this meeting until town meeting day elections on March 7th. I'm pretty sure that the applications of these two applicants were first posted late Friday afternoon, December 16th. So it's unlikely that many District 2 residents know much about either of the candidate, uh, the applicants or the fact that one of them is to be appointed by the city council this evening. This is not a great example of local government transparency or public engagement. While both applicants certainly seem qualified for this position, I will again offer my strong recommendation that the council not make su any such appointment at this time. As you know, at the council's November 16th meeting, I suggested that it was a bad idea to appoint a brand new inexperienced council member for such a minimal number of meetings between now and March 7th, most of which would be dealing with the arcane details of a budget that will have been arrived at through months of budget discussion by the other city council members. However, my concern is less about these practical aspects of this matter and much more about how such an appointment so close to election time flies in the face of the very basis of democracy, fair and free elections. Just to be clear to everyone, the city council is not required to make such an appointment at this time. If they wish to do so, the council could have left and still can leave this matter entirely in the hands of the voters of District 2, either through a special election or simply by waiting two months until town meeting day elections, at which time it will be required in any case that a candidate be elected to fill the second year of, of Connor's term. Thus, if the city council decides to go through with their intent to appoint one of these applicants now, in my opinion, it will be engaging in an unnecessary and blatantly anti-democratic act that will put the very heavy thumb of the city council on the outcome of the statutory town meeting day election a mere two months from now. Let me explain. Consider, for example, the likely case that the council will recognize the strength of both of these applicants, but nevertheless chooses one to appoint. Now fast forward to late January when prospective candidates for all open city seats must file for election. There will be two separate races in District 2. One to fill out Connor Casey's term by serving one year, and one to fill Jack McCullough's seat for a full two-year term, which might or might not mean running against Jack as a heavily favored incumbent. Suppose then that the December appointee decides to run to be actually elected this time to the seat to which they've been appointed two months before. That candidate would have a significant advantage over anyone else who might have wanted to run for that seat. That advantage having been bestowed upon them by the city council's December undemocratic appointment. But that's not all. Now consider the further possibility that Jack has decided to run for mayor so that his two-year seat will come check, open. Check, check, check. Oh, sorry, Peter, I just want to interrupt and say you're at about three minutes right now. So if you could uh, wrap I up. I am wrapping up. That would be great. Thanks. Okay. So I'll skip the next part. But... As a result of this unnecessary and undemocratic appointment process, at the end of December, this could have significantly could significantly shape the entire composition of the District 2 City Council membership, a third of the council itself. So I strongly urge that you can reconsider your November 16th decision to make an interim appointment, or perhaps, having heard my concerns, one or both of the candidates might withdraw their application for appointment and instead run for election on town meeting day, or perhaps pledge that if appointed, they will fill the seat only on an interim basis and not run for election in March. Any of those options would result in a much fairer and more democratic election of both District 2 City Council seats. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so and just to clarify, our understanding of the charter as it's written is that we do need to uh, make an appointment tonight as we are reading it. Um, so, so go ahead. No, so a couple things. Oh, okay. the, um, first of all, there is no provision for a special election for a council seat. That's actually not a choice that the council has other than the vote for the one year term. The charter requires filling the seat by appointment if there's more than 90 days left on on the term. and because his term has over a year uh, remaining, um, the, the council is required to, to fill this by appointment upon vacancy. Uh, 
obviously you can time when you fill that, but they're, they're, it's not really an opt out with the mayor. They, there's a little bit more flexibility that you can call a special election uh, forthwith, I believe what it says. And I, I think that once the mayor tenders her resignation at the next meeting, we'll schedule the council to vote for a special election on town meeting day uh, to handle that. So, um, so the, the charter is clear. If there's more than 90, it can't be a special election. If there's more than 90 days left on the term, then it must be filled by appointment. And it just says the council shall fill. It doesn't, but it doesn't set a time frame for it. So. All right, thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, David uh, Ulbrich. David, you are still muted. Great. Here we go. Uh, first of all, I thank you for your time. Uh, I want to rise in support of, of Pellin Cone for the, the District 2 Council seat. I have known Pellin for almost five years. I myself live here in uh, Montpelier, and I work with Pellin at Norwich University. She has impeccable leadership credentials, whether in academic or in uh, experience. Uh, yet I also detect and I've seen a servant spirit that's really hard to have. If you're a leader, can you also have the servant spirit? As an immigrant herself, she's come from Turkey to Vermont uh, and made a life for herself and her family. These are two vastly different worlds. And I think her, uh, uh, her potential service on the council internationalizes the council and brings a uh, diverse perspective that it might not otherwise have seeing how uh, uh, Vermont is about 3% minorities. Uh, she is a leader that is also able to collaborate and to facilitate. So she can adapt her leadership to collaboration, facilitation, and so on. She's very concerned about DEI issues. She served on the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, which is very important. These are timely issues that everyone in Vermont and everyone in Montpelier is concerned about. I think that's invaluable experience. Um, I also know that she's acutely aware of cultural challenges that go on, of just uh, mannerisms or attitudes or ideas that, uh, you know, native uh, Montpelierians, Montpelierites, whatever, uh, may have that may or may not be acceptable to others so she can help educate. Uh, lastly, or two, two more points, she's been active on a variety of councils, both at the local leadership level and with uh, the uh, uh, Vermont Council on World Affairs. And I think that that local and global connection, not only individually be based on her experience as being born in Turkey and coming here, but then also acting on that can ha also has great potential in terms of internationalizing uh, experience here, here in Vermont, perhaps also um, even working with uh, future businesses and other partners that are international. So I rise in support of her and I hope you will seriously consider her. Thank you. Thank you. Upstairs. All right. Anyone else with this digitally wish to make a comment? Okay. Well, thank you. Oh yeah, go ahead. Just briefly. Oh, come on. Uh, just briefly, I'm not going to get into all of this, but there were comments made earlier tonight about public records, and I just point that all but one of those have been raised multiple times in the past. They've all been responded to in writing to the council and public. There's public response. Obviously, the commenter doesn't like the response, um, but it's all it's all been uh, addressed. Uh, and I believe there was one new one here, uh, and I to which I think the commenter has made a good point. Uh, um, all right. Well, with that, we will move on then uh, to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent? Oh, yes, Donna. For public comment. Oh, yes. Go ahead. And I was going to bring it out. So this is the last evening for Anne and Connor. And I wanted to say something at the beginning, because guess what? All of you will probably be gone at the end. <laughs> And it's just been wonderful serving with both of you. And so we brought some sweets. Please help yourself up here. Um, but just, you know, can't begin to say what the privilege has been. Connor and I rasp one another a lot. Of course, he's tall. I'm short. Bound to be opposites. Uh, but it's been really interesting. And Anne, you've been here since I got on the council. It's really been a treat. And your leadership is just such a caring one. So 
I really wish you both well in the House and the Senate. You know, really show them how to collaborate the way you've taught us and to listen. It's really, really been impressive. So a little bit of your personalities. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> I feel Anne. Anne is a little understated. <laughs> It looks really friendly, and it is, but it's got a strength of steel. <laughs> and this one looks overwhelming and could be a bit bullish, but he's not. So <laughs> this is my souvenir to you two. Oh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Donna. Oh, so, that's so sweet. And Peter's going to love it. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that is adorable. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll have more to say uh, later in the evening. <laughs> Okay, anyone else? Uh, yes, Gary. Oh, oh, okay, so we're on to the consent agenda now. Okay, just just checking. Uh, yes, go ahead. So I, I apologize for still being a little bit unclear, but there's something that I would like to not oh, on the consent wanna, agenda. Oh, I'm sorry, I'd like yeah. to request that something come off the consent okay. agenda. I'm not, I, okay, there we go. I did it. The, um, the um, ballot item about withdrawing from CVPSA. Okay. I would like. Okay, so is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move to accept the consent agenda uh, minus item C, these CVPSA withdrawal. Okay, a uh, motion in a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay. Uh, do you want to, should we take it up now? Um, or is it a longer thing? Sure. It's yeah. not, it's not a long discussion yeah, go for at it. all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just, it just felt to me like something that was more appropriate, not on the consent agenda okay. um, because we, we started discussing it last week. I didn't feel like we made a final decision last week. I felt like we asked for a draft of um, language to go on the ballot. I'm in favor of it. I'm happy to have it there. Um, I don't feel like we need a big discussion about it. I just wanted it to have its own time. I think that's fair. Yeah, thanks. Um, any thoughts folks would like to share on uh, this ballot language? Yep. Not particularly the ballot language as much as the process and how we ended up here. Uh, I think it's a mistake to withdraw. I think we could see other towns joining at the same time as the two founding members are withdrawing and you might see the legislature conditioning the grants that you are so over optimistically expecting uh, being conditioned upon having regional governance in place. I can share with you federal guidance from SafeCom and SISA that specifically requires the type of regional governance that CBPSA had the potential of under new leadership. Okay. It's been a failure of leadership and a, uh, you know, bickering and turnovers and vacancies not filled and a lack of recruitment. We created two committees, one to get new members to join, new towns to join, and one to work on charter changes. Nothing ever came of those committees in the last two years. So basically, I think it's a mistake. I think you're not informed enough, but the idea that the chiefs and the managers have gone behind closed doors, claim that those aren't open meetings and they're going to figure out a way to grab this money is anti-democratic, it's unethical, it's totally contrary to why we joined CVPSA, and it's premature. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else uh, wish to make a comment? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll just yep, add, yep. there's nothing unethical, illegal about staff work being done um, in an office by people doing work. It's not an appointed committee of either council. Okay. Uh, so is there a motion regarding item C? I move we approve it. Second. For the discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so uh, that uh, item passes. So I think we are now up to some appointments. Um, and I know we have at least one of the people with us uh, digitally. Um, Lisa Stewart, would you uh, uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District? 
Sure. I'm Lisa Stewart. I live on Fuller Street, in Montpelier. I've been a resident of Montpelier for about 30 years, and I'm interested in serving on the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District because I have about a 16-year history of working with environmental organizations, including the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District, where I worked for eight years, six of them as general manager and also Vermont Public Interest Research Group. I also have degrees in public administration and human resources and have a lot of work focus on organizational finance. So I think this is a good way for me to serve the city of Montpelier. Super, thank you. And any questions for Lisa? Okay. Uh, all right. And I don't see Brett Apple with us, uh, but just want to check, uh, see if Brett is there, is out there, either digitally or in person. Okay. Uh, so, team, we can either make some appointments right now or we can go in, into executive session. Uh, Connor. Yeah, I'll move to appoint Lisa Stewart to the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District and Brett Appel to the Complete Streets Committee. Second. Okay, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. All right, well, if, if, I think that's a good idea. Yep, so we are going to um, flip one of the items here. Uh, since we have... A couple members of our, our Senate delegation here. Um, we are going to have that item before we have our budget conversation. So, um, yeah, so I guess we'll we'll invite uh, Senator Perchlick and Senator Cummings up to the table here. And I am going to just keep sitting here. Oh, oh, OK. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't. Uh, and and. Representative-elect Casey and Representative-elect McCann is here as well, digitally. Yes, I'm going to keep sitting here, but um, just to facilitate things. But I will be listening. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for being here all. Um, so we, ha we do have a, a, a legislative uh, committee. And so I'm actually going to turn things over to them to, to start out. Uh, yeah, to kick things off. <laughs> sure, I can start us off. Um, so we had really looked at um, a range of priorities that, of course, impact the city. Um, it's a lot of things that are going to look really familiar to you because it's a lot of things that were on last year's agenda, um, you know, really looking at, um, in some ways, the ongoing impacts of the pandemic. And so things like you know, the return to work of state employees and local office buildings, um, local option taxes, supporting things like TIF and so on. Um, also, there's several items around uh, responsive and responsible government um, looking at, you know, we've got, of course, our strategic plan we'll keep an eye on and legislation that would be consistent with that. Um, there is, uh, you know, housing, of course, I know is going to be a top priority that you're all going to be working on. And um, some of the examples that are in this agenda were looking at um, additional funding to agencies such as Downstreet, um, as we look to build more housing, expanding funding for um, ADUs, um, looking at how Act 250 uh, changes could help make it easier to um, develop in places like downtown Montpelier, um, and then a suite of environmental stewardship um, such as you know, continuing our work on PFAS, micro transit opportunities, uh, working towards net zero, um, and so on. And um, you know, infrastructure. Of course, uh, we've been looking to. Uh, you heard earlier tonight in the public comment um, how we've been looking to uh, build public restrooms, and it would be great to partner with the state on looking at how um, we can move that forward. Um, and of course, looking at how the infrastructure and other federal money can be used to help. Um, get to local governments like Montpelier and um, be put to work for um, our communities. And let's see, and then a couple public health and safety. Um, you know, we heard earlier about, for example, the social workers and the need for um, investing in that. And, you know, of course, there's both a potential city role there and also a state role for um, funding that important work. Um, so looking for how we can make sure that we're, you know, providing those resources in our community. So a lot there and happy to answer questions and or turn it over to 
the colleagues who had helped put this together who want to expand on anything I missed. Talk to myself about <laughs> <laughs> if I can jump in, um, you know, I know we sent you all this list, and I think we're also interested in hearing what you think are going to be the top issues and which issues here have the most likelihood to move forward. We did pull out of that list the highest priorities, just advocating for safe return of the state employees. I think that's really is having an uh, an issue in downtown. Um, Definitely uh, human services funding for supporting those experiencing homelessness, including temporary housing options, peer support workers at permanent housing. Um, you know, small cities like us are really being asked to take on something that we really don't know what we're doing, frankly. And so uh, we'd ask that the state really step up. And I know it's a challenge. I know you're aware of that. But I, I think you'll hear that from other cities, not just Montpelier. PFAS, of course, is a huge issue. Public restrooms. We think uh, you know many people come to downtown to visit the state facility, state house. Uh, if there was a way we could partner on funding to create a public restroom, I know uh, we worked on that last year, and um, BGS pretty much shot that down. So if there's any way we could get that back uh, into the front burner, that would be great. And then obviously any uh, climate change mitigation. We thank you all for your support last year on the. Uh, uh, communications funding and to the extent that it comes back to the legislature we'd ask if you have continued support we're not sure it's going to but if it does certainly would ask for your continued support there it's a very important project for both, both uh, not only our city but barry and the entire basically your whole senate district so be very um, very important project any thoughts <laughs> I mean, I feel like I could comment on like <laughs> what I think might have the chance, but I, I'm the freshman here, so. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the two biggest issues I've heard, or at least the biggest money issues, are going to be child care and paid family leave. Um, the amount of money needed to do any of those is quite high. So that will be a challenge and probably suck up a lot of that energy. Um, Andy and I finished today um, the final report and kind of sort of draft legislation on going to an income-based property tax, uh, income-based education tax. Um, there's a lot of questions that we didn't get to like the impact on the ability of the general fund to raise money to do a lot of the additional programs. But we did hear from the league um, and do know that that would free up some money perhaps for the city to use. Um, and we did after Act 60 went in. Um, and that the tax rate hasn't been the, the just intense issue it was before Act 60. Um, so that I think will get introduced as a bill. It seems to be out there. Um, other than that, we'll be monitoring the COVID money that, that's gone out as it's as some of it doesn't get used and comes back in, we were able to use that money to extend the homeless shelter program, the motel program, at least get us through the coldest months. Um, but the federal money is gone. Um, we spent all or most of it on one time because it was one time funding, but we're back to our regular budget and uh, expectations are high. So it's it's gonna be a financially challenging year. I expect housing and homelessness to be high on the list. You mentioned paid leave yes. and childcare, but I, I, those are the two things I hear statewide as being really. We put 300 million, we put a lot of money into housing. Um, 
unfortunately, it doesn't appear overnight. It's got to get permitted. It's got to get built. And we're seeing the same labor and supply issues that everybody else is. So the money's out there. I think this year, um, well, I'm quite sure this year we're going to see a discussion, probably a bill around the non-homestead property, um, perhaps dividing out the business second home. Don't touch the deer camp issue. <laughs> um, but how, you know, is there some way we can do that that might free up some money or raise some more money? Um, that'll be out there for discussion. I'm sure Airbnbs will come up in that discussion because they are part of it. And we'll probably be watching the success or non-success of the Burlington, uh, you know, just cause only eviction charter change to see if that, how that works and is held. And um, so that'll all be out there. With regard to housing, do you expect um, any kind of regulatory reform, particularly like in, in cities like Montpelier? And, uh, you know, I think the, one of the things we hear is obviously costs. And you, the state yeah. did put a lot of money into that and just the, the cost of land and uh, obviously the incomes for people that can afford. But the, also the duplicative duplicative and perhaps overly regulatory, uh, and I call it out, Act 250, uh, for developed cities, the, the goal of Active 50 is to not have sprawl and to create a disincentive to develop in cities and go do 10 acre lots is, is kind of the antithesis of what you'd hope. So I know we at the league were, were received a, a recommendation for some protect, potentially mandated changes to local zoning, many of which we've already done here in Montpelier, but we were welcome to that, but I think the state also really has to take a hard look at its regulations, particularly around housing and particularly around doubling the efforts in develop already developed growth centers, designated downtowns, incorporated cities, um, and large right. towns that have the capacity to manage it on their own, water and sewer type things. Well, Act 250 change is definitely going to be on the agenda. And I think what happens is that there's a lot of other advocacy around changes and that the issue around downtown act 250 gets caught up in horse fragmentation else. and all a bunch of other so people want it to be one package and everybody agree if we're going to give this change i want my change i don't hear a lot of people arguing against that particularly but it just seems to get caught up in the whole act 250 change unfortunately i think so, you know, I've heard that too. I'll, I'll be quiet after this. But I do think, uh, you know, we have a housing crisis in the state and it, it seems to be the number one issue for every community I talk to. Certainly it's for the League of Cities and Towns. I think it is for the governor. I think it is for the legislature. Um, it seems like we have to be able to really look hard at all of the areas. You know, you did put a ton of money in. That was great. Um, and now what are the other barriers? And you know, I understand forest fragmentation and all those things, but maybe that's not at the same crisis that housing is. And, and you know, this, um, we really ought to be prepared to look at that. And, and, I'll, and I'll get off my soapbox in just a minute, but that also in, in, it includes, you know, one of the things we heard about was if you're on water and sewer, you should, you know, you should have required these lower lot zoning. Okay, fine. But, you know, we have water and sewer goes all the way out Elm Street. Are we going to also improve transit funding for people that might be in unaffordable housing that could take, you know, make these communities uh, better? And, and uh, if we're going to require that parking requirements get taken out, and again, we've already done that here, but are, are we going to look at alternatives for people, whether it's transit or funding structures or however you're going to deal with parking uh, to, to, because we do live in a car climate, whether we want to admit that or not and um and then lastly the homelessness situation you know um people can't afford homes and as we know there's a million reasons why people are homeless there's no one reason but the supports around that have just got to be put in place and i know it's coming from the general budget i know it's not easy but i also know there's nowhere else to go 
right? You're, it's it's, it's going to come from the state's budget or local property taxes or somewhere because there's nowhere else to go. And the state at least has a, a, a structure through the Department of Home, you know, Human Services that ha- should have the know-how to handle it versus um, you know, local governments who plow roads and answer police calls and do these kind of things. And then they're now going to whole human service categories where, frankly, you know, I say we're out over our skis. So, um, okay, I'm done. Yeah. Well, I'd say that, and that, you know, I kind of saw that in the priority list. And I would agree with all that. I would, I know Senator mm-hmm. Cummings, former city official, agrees with that kind of local control of the state mm-hmm. giving these unfunded mandates is something that I think your delegation would support. And your delegation is going to be even stronger uh, with knowledge on that issue. So I, I I think we totally agree on that. The only thing just on talking about the priorities that I saw that would be difficult is uh, trying to find a way to bring the state workers back or even advocating. I mean, you know, we can we can mention that there's an impact, yeah. um, but there that's going to be a difficult thing, I think. I think it's it'll be interesting to see what the state does with this leased space that's all empty. And are they going to let it go? Are they going to make that savings, but then permanently lose that space potentially? Uh, that that was the only one that I kind of had to scratch my head on. So like, I didn't know how I was really going to help the city on that one. But uh, if you have ideas, uh, I'm open to hear them. But everything else I supported and definitely thought that we could yeah. work work together on. No, I, I just absolutely mm-hmm. agree with Senator Perchick on that point. It's hard to force the administration's hand to bring back state workers. But, you know, as you look at those empty state lots every day, it's a bit frustrating when we're scrounging for a little piece of land to put like a covered shelter, right? So it's got to be either like one or the other, right? The state workers don't come back or the state's got to be a bit flexible with that land, you know? And that might entail building housing, maybe even building it up where you keep the parking underneath, right? So I, th- I think it'd be good to look at that anyways, but yeah, I agree with you. Dead on. Yeah. I, you know, everybody, I'm on a couple of boards and there's also an employee shortage and um, some employees like working at home, especially when there's no child care or affordable child care available. And so I think the state, like everybody else is working through, we've had a forced um, expectation of remote work. And for some people it's worked for others. It hasn't, um, you know, and it's going to take a while to figure out what that new mix is going to look like. Um, and I know what that impact is having on the city. I mean, I just, this parking, <laughs> that's not a good thing. Um, you know, that really does make, make a difference, not having those employees um, here especially at noontime. The the eating establishments, I'm sure, are really taking a hit because I used to eat downtown every day. Now I'm retired and I don't. Um, but there's a whole lot of state employees that aren't, and that hurts. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I'm going to speak in minority voice because I think remote working is what the state should become a premier remote employer and that it, you really should have it there as a benefit mm-hmm. and that I feel that the city has to adjust and the council has to help downtown make those changes, that that's a reality. And it's less wear and tear on our roads. It's less pollution. It's less cost to have that second car. There's so many benefits by reducing commuting. So I'm all for it. <laughs> But I, I do feel like, you know, that the state has a chance to really grab a hold and be very innovative and not just passive because they have to now. Now we have some choices. And so I really hope you have some think tanks creatively outside the box because there's a lot going on in some businesses that are really showcasing, showcasing this. And you also, I think we found out being remote and the Senate was remote for a year and a half. Um, to Washington came just hours but, after the Biden administration announced that it would provide. Hello. Um, that 
there's good things. I mean, I like being able to go up in my slippers and put a suit jacket on and sit there. I was shocked when I had to put on shoes. Um, but you also lose something in corp- corporate group culture. I think um, a lot of the resignations may have come earlier this this year because of that remote thing, you lose the support you get from people going through, you know, you can't sit there and say, do you know what that idiot just did? But at some point, people need to do that. You need to be able to share the frustration um, with somebody else that understands it. When I was sitting in your seat, I used to say, if my dog could talk, I would be in big trouble because that's where I vented when I went home and the dog would just look at me and nod. But you you lose that when you're all alone. All you've got is the dog to talk to and or your spouse, and that could be equally disturbing. So, um, you know, I, I think that's just part of the balance we're trying to figure out is how do we fill all those needs, the time needs, the pollution needs, but also the interactive human needs. I should say that that Councilor Bate had a good point that it's it's likely we're going to have to figure out a way to adjust to it. And the way that the state could be supportive to the city definitely want to be part of those discussions. Because as a state employee in my day job, I don't think they're all coming back. I think we're, at least where I work, the the leadership team doesn't see a decrease in production, actually sees an increase in production. So I don't see a lot. I mean, some people are coming back. So I think there is going to be less workers, at least unless something else changes. So how, how do we transition? What do we use for the space? You know, what can we transition to housing? How can how can we solve the problem of having more people downtown, but also help with the housing? Great example across the street that that affordable housing that was put in that second floor. So I think one other issue that I want to mention is more, I support full funding of VHCB so they can do more support cities like Montpelier for projects like that. I think the one, maybe there's others, but one positive light on the housing front is that we can pay for affordable housing through the property transfer tax and property transfer tax has got a lot of money in because we've had a lot of property transfers at a high rate. And so I think we we should use that opportunity to support more affordable housing with that with that funding. So we do that. And then having spent a lot of time on downtown redevelopment as that noon market, the people that got out for a lunch hour and came down and shopped, how do you keep them here? How do you or bring them in on the weekends? How do you um you know, what is downtown, what is the future of downtown going to look like? That's your job. <laughs> I appreciate the feedback from the workers, and I get it, um, obviously. But the reports we get from our business communities, actually weekends and evenings are, are as good or better than they have been. It's, it's the weekdays when uh, people are missing um, that used to be here. And obviously, we need to support them and urge whatever can be done to get more people downtown or to productively reuse if, if the land to create more opportunities, whether, you know, uh, for people in need or people who need housing or other commercial, you know, things to create more vibrancy to support people and provide more jobs for people who need, need jobs. I mean, obviously right now it's hard to find employees, but that won't always be the case. So property as parking lot. So if we can convince the state they don't need them anymore because they're not going to have the workers, then let's convert those to to something useful. And housing downtown is really good. A lot of the housing we're developing is lower income housing. If we could get more of a broader expanse there, um, then that would also be helpful to the downtown economy. So all things to work on. Yeah, downsizers. Two other things that asked all five of you that are attending is child care. Really think outside the box. Why isn't child care part of our education system? And that we have private and public child care that is integrated. 
I think that's really important to consider when you're looking at it. Also, we are tied to the federal tax base. What do you all think about the state doing its own thing? Yeah. Uh, when I when you do your income tax, your yeah. state income tax depends on your federal income tax. They're tied together. Well, just right at and this we, point, it's just your adjusted gross income. We other than we're starting at that base, which we. Anyway, I'm just saying, yeah, yeah, I mean, we are we yeah. we used to be coupled where you were a percentage of your federal tax liability. We decoupled a long time ago. Um, and when was it? The Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So probably 2017, um, when that tax cut resulted in Vermonters paying $35 million more in taxes, we completely rewrote the tax code to prevent that. So we are essentially decoupled other than that adjusted gross income. And I think it's just it would just be a duplicate effort um, unless you want us to be taxing the first $30,000 of social security. Okay, so then it's all up to the state individually to decide whether to tax the higher brackets at a higher rate. Oh yes. Oh, do so. And we have the second most progressive tax code in the country. Yeah, that's something that I had mentioned a lot in my campaign was adding back a fifth tax bracket uh, to ask the wealthiest Vermonters to pay more, basically. Um, so it's on my, certainly on my radar. <laughs> that got lowered. It got, it came down, it came up. Um, because the last tax study committee said in order to be competitive with the surrounding states, we needed to get that top bracket down because that's what they looked at. And we came out looking terribly in every national tax report and they forgot that your total tax bill is less, but it was just that upper bracket that got reported. So that's how we got here. I chair a tax I committee. Yeah. <laughs> Look forward to learning more. Um, anything else folks want to chime in about? And I, I want to check in with you, uh, Representative Elect McCann, and if you want to weigh in on any of this, you're certainly welcome to, but you don't have to. <laughs> Oops. Bedtime. <laughs> oh, Kate, you are muted. Oh, I think she's out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, and rejoining. Can you hear me now? Yes. Crazy. I just <laughs> want to say I'm encouraged by the legislative agenda that the city council is bringing forward. And I look, I look forward to working with you all and, uh, moving things forward. When Connor and I were out knocking on 3,600 doors, um, what we heard most was um, that homelessness and affordable housing was um, top priority. So look forward to, to moving things forward and making things better for uh, Vermont and, and for the folks in Montreal. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I guess the only thing I would add is um, I, I feel very tuned in to PFAS and climate initiatives and um, uh, feel well-versed in the other topics as well, but particularly in those. So um, looking forward to, to working on all of that. So, uh, and particularly uh, just for the sake of folks listening, I anticipate that uh, the clean heat standard or some new version of it may uh, come back uh, and uh, as well as uh, potentially a, a renewable energy standard. So looking at heat uh, being more affordable for Vermonters in the first uh, that I mentioned, and then uh, looking at building more renewables, uh, hopefully in Vermont, uh, with that uh, renewable energy standard. So two things on my radar. Yeah. Comments? Um, you may, 
these are touching on the topics that y'all have emphasized or uh, but at the joint fiscal committee meeting, Senator Cummings, you'll recall, uh, Representative Kornheiser used the example related to public safety funding that you still have an agency at the state level that makes sure there's equal opportunity in education. Uh, I feel it's real important with Act 250, with homelessness funding, with public safety communications, with uh, ho housing, ADUs, and uh, regulation of Airbnb, that the state set a ground floor that you require, for instance, you don't just shovel money at a town that has refused to plan, disingenuously claim to be concerned about homelessness and bathrooms, but has refused to do a plan year after year after year. So you condition your funding on accountable planning and matching funds at the local level before they trigger and release the state funding. Because you you need a mechanism. We need the lever of state funding to force accountability and transparency at the local level. I mean, it's ironic to have me be the one telling you this, but uh, with Act 250, uh, Act 250 can solve, I mean, can at least per serve as a safety valve to prevent bad projects from being ramrodded through by unaccountable officials. Uh, the garage was a case in point even though it failed uh, on an appeal for Act 250 jurisdiction. But it's not unheard of for a town this, this size to pack a certain council in and ram some projects through and ruin the town for the next 50 years. So that participation, that public participation of Act 250, where a lot more eyes and opportunities to uh, present evidence are important. Um, Accessory dwelling units, and we we need regulation. If you can expedite the process of whatever charter change is necessary so that we can require an immediate inventory of Airbnb units and put some kind of cap on that, as well as accelerate the best opportunities for accessory dwelling units, these are things that the local towns lack the capacity to do and that can be done in a more organized fashion at the state level and then open up the floodgates of opportunity at the local level. Um, remote work, uh, telecommunications, re telecommuting requires resilience and well-engineered broadband, which we are not in the process of. They, they're sh taking shortcuts on the engineering. Even tonight's meeting is, is really flawed based on our communications infrastructure, even from the mics in the room. So. We need to focus on high quality. We need to be able to read the closed captioning up there when we can't hear the microphones. So that's an area where planning, uh, and I'll, I'll close with one related to the your, quote, staff meetings, your, your loose cannon organization called Twin Cities Team to steal the work that CVPSA did and own the system for Montpelier. It's very corrupt, Bill. Don't, don't laugh. But- it runs totally contrary to the statutory telecommunications policy and goals of 202C and 202D, which require participation, draft plans, review, public comment on draft plans, agency response to public comment on draft plans. Y'all think you can end run all that, and you can't. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments folks would uh, like to make? Anything, um, anything for them? Yeah. You know where to find us. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I know Bill has my email. <laughs> Super. No, you don't. I mean, that, that's, that's how we learn what's happening out where, where the rubber hits the road. Similarly, if there's issues uh, about um, local government, whether it's Montpelier in specific or just general. I know there's the league and all that stuff, but we, we have some experienced folks around. So we'd be happy to, you know, you know, from your time, if you're a Montpelier official, you get down, you get hauled down there a lot because you're the handiest local official. Well, so. that's soon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have most of my wit, my staff, I think on Zoom. There's no reason why they should have to sit there. And um, any of the witnesses that have to travel, and most of the observers, I think, will be on Zoom. So if we need you, you don't even have to run down the street. You can say, let Rutland do it. 
<laughs> but then you don't get all the other interaction that you well, you don't. About. I mean, and that's what we we found out is that if one witness on one side of an issue is in person and the others on Zoom, there is a feeling that the person that's in person has an advantage. And um, I think they're right. Uh, so we when this anything controversial, everybody will be there. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you all being here. Okay. All right. So now we'll go to our budget discussion. And for this, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Kelly, if you want to come up to the desk or, or um, Bill, or anything else you all want to say about this? I don't have a lot to say. Obviously, we did the overview presentation at the last meeting. Uh, since that time, we have posted um, videos of all the departments sort of doing an outline of their budget. I'm sure you've all watched them many times and have them memorized. And they're here to um, they're here to answer whatever questions you might have. We've also posted the budget book yesterday. You have a copy in front of you. We have the worksheet uh, where you can plug different numbers in and see the impact on the bottom line of the budget and the tax rate. I think we're prepared to put that up if you would like, but really, at, you know, um, we're here to be your resource. Now we've turned the budget recommendation over to the, the council uh, and however you would like to proceed, we're here to help in whatever way possible. Like I said, we have pretty much all the key team here and um, we're here to help you do your job. Yes, Carrie. So um, I just want to reiterate and point out that um, I need to recuse myself from any discussion about the city clerk budget and that I can't vote on the city clerk budget as well since I'm married to the city clerk and it would be a conflict of interest. So if we could, if, if at any point we're going to be discussing that portion of the budget, I will step out. And when it comes time to vote, um, we'll need to pull that one out and vote on it separately. And thank you all for accommodating that. I appreciate it. Well, that's a big controversial budget. So, uh, All right. So I I think uh, probably what makes the most sense is to start uh, with where we ended last time uh, at 7.4 percent with the um, all the all the items that were included, and see if folks would like to either add anything or subtract anything. Um, I, will, I have some ideas, but I want to see what your thoughts are first. Uh, Connor. Can we just go over the social worker position a bit, maybe? It's um because yeah, my, my recollection was it had been vacant for quite a while there, and we did have trouble filling it, which is why it disappeared. But maybe just talk about it a bit. And I I also like my understanding was part it was partially state funded in the past, right? Um and I, I don't know if that's set to continue or yeah. Well, Chief Norton is in I, I, think, the the new, I think the new chief Norton is the man for the job. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. First of all, thank you. Uh, this whole process was extremely challenging, um, and like you said, that position was was un unfilled, and we struggled to fill it. Um, we've kind of reevaluated that between Washington County and Berry City PD and our PD, and some of the needs that we've kind of identified were more of a, a screener that could actually write mental health papers. Um, so we're trying to see if we can find some funding for that type of position and then the challenge is can we can we find it and then fill it um dan told is exactly right this when, when we have these discussions they're extremely hard um i was just talking to washington county if we had the twenty thousand dollars back we could probably do that work because part of it is state funded um so yes you know that it, these are hard choices but uh it, it was challenging when it's not filled and you know when you're looking at some of the other things that you have to to talk about uh, the unfilled was made it a little bit easier. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that answered your question. And that's Chief, can I? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Great to have you on board, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, if I can follow up on that, can you describe uh, a little bit more in detail what the screener uh, is or does? Sure. A, a, a screener is uh, a mental health clinician who who can actually write mental health papers. Um, so, if there was somebody that was. Exactly. In, so I, I was just going to explain that. Yep. So if there is somebody that is in a media crisis that needs to be seen by a psychiatrist, they can do those papers. We can take custody and facilitate 
them getting the help that they need. Um, with the social worker position, it was it was great. It was the the common theme was that it was underutilized. Um, it, I don't have a great answer other than we were in COVID. Maybe it wouldn't. It would be a little better utilized now um you know but for our needs when someone was in crisis to have that ability to do the immediate service to get them the needs and then us to be able to help them instead of having the social worker come then call the screener and then wait and do that part um so kind of our evaluation process was a screener would be a little bit more efficient for us and then the the whole idea of it when we first started this conversation many many years ago was to have a screener and it's kind of evolved to a social worker um so we're, we're kind of playing with that. And Washington County is looking for funding. I'm literally texting with Gary saying, I'm, I'm going to try. <laughs> so, uh, but everybody here is going to try to, you know. And so is the screener that you're talking about someone who would be employed by Washington County Mental Health versus the uh, the city of Montpelier? Yeah, the, the, the social worker was also employed by Washington County. So yes, they would be there. Um, they already have a network of screeners. And we thought we might be able to tap into those a little bit more effectively that maybe they could shift and change different ones into the police departments and we could build even more relationships. So the, the ideas are kind of getting hammered around and it, it was helpful. They, they had some, um, but we're just not quite there yet. Thank you. Any other, yes, Jack. Well, I could potentially add a little more to that because the, I interact with the screeners all the time in my day job and uh, the, the statutory process for in, uh, involuntarily admitting someone to the hospital starts with a contact, typically starts with a contact with one of the community mental health centers, and the entire state is covered by them. Um, <clears throat> the Washington County mental health only covers Washington County, but uh, all the counties are covered. And um, the screeners at, at, or another title that they go by as crisis clinician are people who are cer certified by the state to uh, to do evaluations of people in crisis and so when someone is out is in a psychiatric crisis they will typically go out and uh, meet with them where they are whether it's at their homes or out uh, out in pub public on a street or something or in the emergency department if they've already been uh, taken there and they will evaluate whether the person appears to have a mental illness and whether they appear to be a danger to themselves or others as a result of the mental illness. And if the mental health professional and then a doctor both sign off on this paperwork, it's called an application for involuntary or for emergency exam, they can be uh, taken to a hospital held there and evaluated. Um, and so in most of my cases, one of the witnesses that I'm cross-examining is, is the screener who uh, testifies about what, what the interaction is and what they observed that was a danger. And, and they don't always uh, involuntarily admit someone. We, they sometimes get to the point and they conclude, well, I understand why you're concerned, but it doesn't get to the point where we think the person is so dangerous that they need to be uh, involuntarily admitted. And one of the things they try to do is uh, get the person to either admit themselves voluntarily to the hospital or see what other resources they can uh, mobilize to get the person, you know, to get the person's needs met potentially without hospitalizing them. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Lauren. Just following up on that. Congratulations. Awesome. Um, so am I understanding right that the there's there's not funding for that position in this, but the hope is being able to work with Washington County Mental Health and be looking for funding from grants or the state or whatever um, to try to, to do that. But that's going to be the status if we pass the budget as is. Budget for that position for the Montpelier share. So we are we are working with Washington County to find some funding, but that's not guaranteed. So, and and if that was a sh if that is, I don't know if there's potential for a shared position with Barry again or shared with them. Is there 
do you have any ballpark? Like, is like we had a full 70,000 for a social worker? Is it potentially less money to put in money for a screener that could be a shared position? So the funding for just that position was 20,000. And then the other 50 was the half time position that we've never been able to fill. Uh, so I think, you know, I mean, obviously we come back to the city council, but if we actually had a candidate and state funding and Barry was on board, we would probably come with some sort of proposal for where we could, you know, scrounge up $20,000 because it, it's that important. But the 70,000 was the big one because we hadn't even, I think, got an applicant for the second position. And um, so it was like, why would we carry this? Another thing that people may not be fully aware of is that uh, at among all the community mental health centers across the state at any given point they probably have a thousand vacancies combined you know howard center has a hundred or a couple hundred just uh, at any time on their on their own and it's I keep arguing that uh, the legislatures should give them much, much more money than they have, but that they really have a hard time uh, attracting and retaining people. They're not paid that well. And some of what you have to do in those positions is kind of uh, unpleasant or jobs, that, things that not everyone wants to do. Um, any other questions um, for the chief about this? Okay. Is the public allowed to comment at this point, Ann? Uh, I'm going to go with yes. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd like to make two, two comments. Uh, first of all, regarding this issue of not being able to fill that role, um, question, I guess this is for the, for the chief. How um, do you know how much effort was put into hiring a peer um, crisis worker, crisis worker, as opposed to a, a traditional clinician or a, a you know and or social worker, because that's a huge, or not a huge, but that is an untapped pool of um, of mental health resource that not that frequently is not considered when it comes to, to positions like this. Yeah, sure. I, I don't have an answer for that. Washington County was taking care of the hiring processes. Uh, so I, I just don't have that answer. I don't know what they were doing for the recruitment of that. Yep. Fair enough. And the, the second question is, or I guess it's more of a, an idea. It, I, I've managed long, uh, bigger departments in my career, and I recognize it's a real Hobson's choice about trying to figuring out where to allocate monies in a budget like this. Um, and money not, not spent um, for an embedded social worker is, is uh, money left on the table. And I understand, um, you know, the position you're in. I guess I'd throw out the idea of thinking out of the box in, in a way, and this is just off the top of my head, and that would be um, while we're recruiting for that position, um, bring in Temp, a temp, temporary law enforcement resources. I don't know if that exists. I'm thinking of the uh, the nursing model, you know, traveling nurses who fill. Now, obviously, they're expensive. Um, and and uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not asking to have a, a discussion around this idea. I just wanted to throw it out uh, to say, if we if we if we step back and think creatively, there are ways that we can make sure that that our our city funds are being used efficiently and effectively. Um, but at the same time making sure that we're, we're on the right side of the trend of having the right resources to address uh, crises in, in the street. So that's all. Um, thank you. Thank you. Dan, I just want to check. So you, you don't have any other questions that you would like to ask or comments you want to make about this? I'm going to take that as a no, you are, you are done commenting on it. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, my, the, the reason I bring it up is just because like, so we usually don't do, um, uh, like back and forth. So if you have multiple questions, if you could ask them together and make all of your comment all at the same time, that would be great. Um, so Dan, was there anything further you wanted to say about the budget? Okay. 
cool. Just wanted to to check in on that. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and thank you for for bringing that up. Um, any other uh, questions, thoughts? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Steve Whitaker again, specifically on this topic, I think we need to think of a different different model than embedded within the police department, you know, where this is inextricably linked to the unhoused population that we we drive folks, we deny them bathrooms and showers long enough, they become more and more unhinged and they act out, et cetera. They trash the pocket park or whatever. And we I have witnessed an incident with a erratic person up on the transit center property. And this needs needs attention. You need to hold your police department accountable for it. A, a shared response where the Capitol Police come down. Now, we've prohibited our police department from having tasers, but the Capitol Policeman is sitting there anxious to pull out his taser ready to... This guy was just seriously just wait. And we had to wait, what, an hour for the screener? 45 minutes? It was an extremely long time. The, the beanbag shotguns were all prepared and carried around and... It was a long drawn out thing. And part of the role of a social worker or a screener or a crisis de-escalation professional needs to be trust that you're not going to get if you embed them with the police department. The, the, maybe the fire department, maybe the uh, justice center, but the, the person needs to be trusted by the, the fragile peripheral community and the police department isn't it we we've all witnessed this police department harass people and steal from people and lie to people arrest people for speaking more than two minutes you know so you, you need to think about it's it's a necessary function of a social worker trained even peer support social worker i spoke to dan about this on his, on his way out uh and the where that sits, where that fits best. We may be able to attract more talent by not putting it in the police department. But I, I have not heard from, I met the social worker once a year, two years ago, three years ago. Never once did she reach back out to talk to me about what I know from interacting with this community. So, you know, I, I think it's, I, I think you get the point. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other thoughts on, particularly on the um, social worker position? Yeah, um, just just a quick one that I I um, do think it would be a good idea. Uh, not in this process, I don't think this is a time for it. But to really kind of take a step back and think about how we handle public safety situations when we're that in ways where we call the police now, but maybe there's another way to respond. Um, because I think that um, it is true that there are many people who will never trust the police, that um, the police are here to enforce laws and um, not necessarily to, um, I mean, I think it's a bigger topic, you know? And so I think if we're thinking about public safety really broadly, um, we need to be thinking about various ways to handle conflict and to handle difficult situations. Um, I don't think that in this budget right now is the time to try to figure that out, but I would like us to have it on our radar for our strategic planning process and for um, the future. Okay. Steve, did you want to weigh in on that? Because I do think our CIT program may be exactly what you're talking about, um, but I'll let Someone who knows what they're talking about. We are feverishly working to implement a crisis intervention team, which is not just the police because you've nailed exactly what we're trying to do. Um, so we have our partners with fire and Washington County, and it could be teachers. It could be anybody in the community that actually cares, that wants to help uh, to deescalate and work with these people and get them the help they need. So the push is to get this training, the first training in March. It's everybody saying that's ambitious, but I'm, an ambitious guy. So we're going to try and push to get this going. And it might be a small class and we might have to measure our success a little differently than some people do, but just to have the first class, I think would be a huge success. So we're trying to, to get that through in March. So maybe just to end that sentence is maybe after March, when the newly elected 
full council is on board, new mayor. Um, we could have we could do a presentation on the CIT program and question you know have an agenda item where it's council gets briefed on what's happening with that and ask questions and take it from there. Okay. Super, and anything thank you. else? Any other? Item? <laughs> uh, yes, Lauren. Just on that point, I mean, we spent for the police review committee, we talked about that a lot. And I mean, I think this model, like when we were looking all over the country at various models, I mean, really what we're looking to do is like right up there with like the best of the best like kind of models out there. Um, I mean, the other piece of it was the funding, the social worker and um, the peer outreach workers. Um, and and so, I mean, I, I do want to kind of fully implement that vision that we had laid out and that, you know, worked very collaboratively with the police department on um, all of those recommendations. So, I mean, it's frustrating that with the staffing shortages is hitting this critical area right now when it's such a need. Um, but I mean, I definitely want to keep an eye on how can we staff this and like, I would, if it does get cut or pared back for this year that we're looking to build that program and invest in it. Cause I think it's, could really help um, accomplish what you're talking about and what the chief's talking about. Cool. That does uh, sort of leave us in a, a place where we haven't quite made a decision about what to do about that, but maybe that's okay right now, um, in, especially in the content, I mean, about the social worker um, position. So um, is it, if it's okay, if there's other things that we... Uh, that folks have on the radar to either add or subtract, um, and then we can discuss. We can we can come back to whether or not we want to um, do anything differently with the uh, social worker position. Um, so, thoughts on the rest of the budget? Oh wow! Okay, so I'm taking your silence as. That you like the budget as it is. Okay, Jack. I've been thinking about, uh, you know, in the in the past year or so, I've been thinking about what uh, what we've been doing with the budget, and uh, part of what I think is that in the last couple of years, including what we voted on the uh, on the last year's budget, and including on including the thing projects that have been in the works for a number of years, uh, we have really taken on a lot of big things that need to be done. And that includes both what we've been asking the uh, residents of Montpelier to pay for, but also what we've been asking the uh, city employees to handle. And, and I think that we're right at the, the right point of not asking anyone to take on a lot of new projects now because with the water resource recovery facility, the, uh, <clears throat> the East state street project, the, uh, uh, country club road project, um, the, uh, Barry street intersection, we're, we're doing a lot. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm gl I'm glad that we're not charging ahead with with some more things, but I also think that uh, we've we've made commitments to to do a lot of of these things, and and we have to keep doing them. and And I know that it it costs money, but it uh, it costs what it costs. And uh, you know, we can't say, well, the rate of inflation is too high, so we're not going to pay the price that the uh, for the fuel that our vehicles uh, <clears throat> need to run, we can't pay for the workers we need to employ. So I think we're hitting the uh, hitting the target pretty much where we need to be. Okay, um, my only maybe I'm the only one that's going to suggest anything different, but um, I would like us to consider. Uh, adding into the the budget the requests from the Wrightsville uh, Beach uh, folks. They were here last time asking for an eight thousand um, dollar increase, uh, and so as it, it it's included in the budget, um, 
at, le- at a level funded um, from last year. Um, and the, uh, I believe it was the Parks Commission uh, asked for uh, some funding. Am I right about that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and that is not in this budget, right? Uh- <laughs> I thought it was like 5,000. Yeah. Okay. Um, So that's on my... uh, That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, 5,000 for the Parks Commission. Um, Yeah. Hi, Alec Ellsworth, Parks Director. Um, So the Parks Commission, I think is, well, I know is asking for basically money for the commission to use at their disposal. So money that's outside of the operating budget of the parks department that they control. And the way they want to use it is to do what they did this year, which is to um, support their management plan process for all the various parks of the city. Yep. And then the other one, Oh, did you have a question? Go ahead, Donna. Uh, Like for example, this year they, they are currently redoing the management plan for all of Hubbard Park and the North Branch Park. So they hired a um, UVM student to do an uh, ecological survey. They hired consultants to analyze data. They did survey, ex- things like that. Yeah. Very good. So did they They have money this year and it's not in the budget for next year? Is exactly. that correct? Yeah. So okay. I think a good comparison is like, for example, the, the Conservation Commission has like $3,500 annual appropriation and uh, the tree board has some amount of money for their nursery. So the, all these committees have small working budgets and the parks commission is looking for that okay. on an annual basis. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yes, they did get funding last year. And so, yeah, they're looking for it as a regular item now. Thanks. Um, and then the other one that was on my radar was the conservation commission. Um asked for 10,000. Um, and so I, I would love to know more about that. Do you have information? <laughs> Come on back. Um, yeah. If you could tell us more about that. Um, I think I can, I actually don't know. I didn't see their request, but I am the staff liaison for the conservation commission. Um, so I'll do the best I can. I think what they requested is um, probably money for the conservation fund. Is that correct? Do you know? So the conservation commission gets an annual budget, a working budget to do things like um, natural resource inventories. And there, they, there's another body called the conservation fund that's made up of two conservation commissioners and one member of the public or three conservation commissioners and two members of the public. doesn't matter how it's made up. But some years ago, there was an appropriation, I think, of $40,000 to that fund, and it's been drawn down now. I think there's maybe $18,000 left in it. And so I think they're, because they asked for this last year, but it didn't make it in. I think it's probably a request from the conservation fund to start replenishing that so they can give grants out to various projects, conservation related. Uh, so those are three uh, things that are not in the current budget that I would like us to consider. Um, s- even if it's not all three of them, if uh, just putting those on the table, um, if we did all three of those, that would bring us to 7.6% as opposed to 7.4. Um, but I'm only one person <laughs> in this group. So thoughts. Yeah. Um, no, when, I can clarify yeah. that. When we did the presentation, we talked about inflation being at 7.7. It's currently a little bit lower than that. But the actual budget proposal was at a 7.4% tax change. Other thoughts? If... Yeah, if I'm the only one that wants that, that's okay. (laughs) 
Go ahead. I, I think I'm a little, I, in principle, I don't have a real problem with that. It's not big dollars for, uh, but I I think I'd feel better with a little more clarity of what, what it's going for. Yeah, for all three of them. Or... Yeah. I, 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 I like the uh, Wrightsville presentation last week. I would be happy with that. With that one. If yeah. we just did the, the Wrightsville Beach contribution. So if it was just that it would be uh seven rounded to 7.5 percent as opposed to 7.4 yeah you can spread that one i have more questions about the conservation Mm -hmm. and i i do understand their fund but i want to understand what their remaining balance is before i add to it yeah that's fair yeah uh, yeah, I'm also very supportive of the Wrightsville edition. Um, the money for the Parks Commission just seems kind of fair if other commissions have some money to to use. Um, but I'm more hesitant about the additional 10000 for the conservation fund. Yeah, for the same reasons others have cited. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. I can't. Yep, go ahead. Um, I don't want to at all argue against park funding um, because we do support the parks and they, you know, certainly we do that. I would say that in drawing a comparison that the parks also has a full staff and a full parks budget uh, where the conservation commission and the tree board and others, well, the tree board has the tree board and and a tree budget. Uh, So some, you know, not everyone, some of those people that have a small stipend to work with don't have, the resources of a full staff to do that. Not that they shouldn't get five thousand dollars, but I just want to call you know when we're making an abstract comparison, just make sure we understand sort of the full picture. Sorry, Alan. <laughs> Other thoughts. Um, Lauren, any thoughts on this? No, I I think Carrie summarized my my feelings as well, like support Wrightsville. And I think, yeah, I would want to better understand the, the need and what, I mean, especially what Bill just said, like what's being done outside of the scope or that the park department, parks department couldn't do. Um, So like what specifically needs to happen through the commission? And I think I could be convinced potentially, but I just don't fully understand why that would need to be separate from the department. I don't really want to. I don't feel like it's my position necessarily to like advocate for it because it's not the parks department's budget. Like it's a separate request. Um, so just from an informational per- point of view, um, I think they, they just want some money to do their work. Like their work is their mission is to make the rules for the parks. And so um, they want to have some money at their disposal to like gather the right information to make those rules. So in the case of like this year is a good example. Um, like, th- like we don't have money in our budget to like hire a UVM student to do an ecological assessment of Hubbard and North Branch Park. Um, so that's information that they wanted. You know, it was useful for their rulemaking process. And so they, you know, they asked for the money and they spent it. I think they're basically, they're moving on to, for their parks. So each year they're going to do one park and they want to have some money to be able to do things like that, that aren't in the parks department's budget. So, and that, that we can't do that staff can't do. So yeah, it's like sort of like a professional services budget, I think would be a good way to explain it. But yeah, I mean, again, it's not my, I wish one of them were here to talk more about it. So I'm probably not doing it justice for them. Sorry, parks commissioners, if you're out there. Other, yeah, good. If we were going to add any of these, do you need a motion or do we just need a normal majority? Um, I think well, so by the end of this process, we should have a motion about the budget. So, uh, we can either do it separately or together, I think, 
right? Correct. Yeah. When the council completes your budget and wants to go to public hearings, you you adopt a budget for the purpose of bringing it to public hearings, and then you don't actually adopt the final budget until the last night of the public hearings. But you would say this is um, so. If you were going to make a motion and wanted to separate out the clerk's office, you could do that. But also, if you were going to amend the base budget, um, you would you would do that. I mean. In theory, someone should have moved the base budget as the basis of the oh. conversation, but we've never done that before. So, so you're amending something that you haven't actually made a motion, but I think that's fine. You say I want to add this to the budget, and I think that's fine. Make this motion, see if it makes sense. So, I move that we adopt the budget as presented with the addition of the Wrightsville Beach increase and the park's extra five thousand dollars, or additional five thousand. Exclusive of the city clerk's budget. Exclusive of the city clerk's budget. Of course. I remember that. <laughs> okay, second. Second. Okay. Further discussion. Okay. Just checking with folks in person. Um, I'm assuming that Dan Towell's uh, hand is left over from the last comment. Um, so... Any other comments from Dan? Oh, yes. Hi. Uh, no, that hand was not left over. Okay. Waiting patiently. No, fair enough. And so, and just so you know, we usually don't go like multiple comments. Um, but uh, since we don't have a lot of folks here, go ahead. Okay. Well, actually, um, I just, I had a, a question for Bill, and this has to do uh, more broadly with creative thinking about funding. Um, is there a position or are there uh, anybody within the city uh, staffing that's working on pursuing alternative funding sources for any any part of the, uh, you know, the, the items that people within the city are, are looking to get funded? In other words, federal funding, foundations, philanthropists, um, you know, other sources, and, and particularly now with COVID, Funding, even though you know some of that has been um, locked up and spent, um, a lot of it, as we well know, is still available. So we have, we have several people that are very actively involved in that. Uh, some within certain departments. Our planning department has you know grant writing people. Um, our we have a sustainability position now that's pursuing grants for those types of you know, net zero uh, funding. Police department's very active, fire, DPW, all uh, actively pursuing. We're actually kind of anxiously awaiting uh, the guidance on the infrastructure funding. Uh, you know, grants, uh, excuse me, philanthropies, those kind of things, charitable contributions have not, with the exception of things like the senior center, um, those tend not to be as successful. People don't always want to donate money to a municipal government unless it's for a very specific thing like a senior center or library, you know, those sorts of things that have their own identity. Maybe the parks could be successful. I know they've written some private grants, but yes, we're very active in grant writing all across the board. Yep. Thank you for that, Bill. Um, and I just want to offer to, to you, Bill, and your staff, um, I sit on a number of statewide committees, uh, mostly relating to the Department of Mental Health, and there still is a tremendous amount of ARPA and other COVID-related funding you know, within AHS and DMH relating to you know, mental health initiatives. So that would include peer, um, you know, um, either peer support or traditional clinician crisis response. And I'd be happy to talk to, to any of your staff members about um, tapping into those channels for anything Great. relating to mental health or substance use. Yeah, we'd love to talk to you about that. Okay, thanks, Bill. Yeah, thank you. All right, so we have a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, Linda Berger. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just lost track of if you add the uh, Wrightsville amount and the parks amount, what is the percent increase in the tax at that point? Thank you. Um, I don't think we actually said so. Great question. Uh, it still uh, rounds to 7.5%. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. We can take a look. Uh, so yes, that would be the correct number for tonight. We could take a look and see if there's, if, I don't know, if we can get it back to 7.4 somehow. But yes. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Nope. Okay. 
And from anyone in person, okay. Uh, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. <laughs> okay, thank you. So now we have to have a motion on the clerk's budget. Thank you. Yes. Um, is there a motion? The clerk's budget is proposed. Second. Okay, further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. And opposed. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, and just want to make sure I was going to record. Oh. Make sure the clerk got that for the record. <laughs> okay, uh, super. So that is the budget that we will move forward with for public hearings um, in January. Those public hearings are on January 11 and January 26 for people that are watching. And we, it, it is still absolutely amendable at that point. Until conversation's council, not done. Until the council votes to place it on the ballot on January 26th and then votes to finalize the ballot, it is still changeable. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. We are uh, up to council reports. This is very exciting. I am, yes, Jack. Since we have some time uh, that, that we're going to take, after council reports and for the appointments, this might be a good time for our 8.30 break. I support that. That sounds great. It is 8.18. We will be back at 8.28 uh, for, uh, to get back into it. Thanks. And so we're up to council reports. And uh, contrary to our normal uh, habit, I'm going to uh, skip Connor when we get to him. So, But otherwise, I'm going to go in the same order. Donna. Thank you, Anne. Just as I said before, I'll miss you both. Wish you well, and we will remember our, your debt to us when we come to the state house. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> um, I just also want to say thank you so much to you, Mayor, and to you, Connor. Um, I, you know, I I'm the new kid here, and you all have all of you have just been so incredibly welcoming and so easy to work with, but um, I'm really going to miss you. Your leadership and has just been amazing. And I feel like you have um, provided a really excellent model for how to run a really good meeting that balances public participation and public input with getting work done. And um, you're very effective at it. And I really appreciate that. And, um, and Connor, I'm, uh, really going to miss you too. And I'm really going to, um, I just have to say that, um, I can always rely on you to be the, um, that voice that's going to be speaking up for people and their, the basic fundamental needs of people. And not that, I mean, everybody here cares about that, but you are, you are the one who comes through absolute 100%, no qualms all the time. And I appreciate that so much. And I'm going to miss that. And I will see you both in the state house a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jack. All right, a couple of things. Um, one is uh, tonight, the uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of uh, <clears throat> Ukraine, was speaking at uh, at Congress, and I think uh, all of us can admire the uh, resistance to the uh, invasion. And I, I think it's great that he's getting support. Um, and second, it has been great working with both of you. <laughs> um, from pretty much the almost the beginning when you were on uh, council, Mayor, from uh, sitting down, talking to you about you know, working with you on campaigns, sitting down, talking about, well, here's when you're talking about planning to run for mayor and talking about what your goals and agendas were, which you have stuck to and uh, continued to work on for, for all the years that you've, you've been here. And uh, I always loved, even before I was on the council, having, having a strong ally for the, uh, for the values that I was uh, trying to give voice to. And so, uh, it has just been great, and uh, and I will miss seeing you at these meetings. We'll need to get together outside of these meetings, and I'll also be 
be over at the state house and maybe see you there. Who, who knows what committees you're going to be on, but, uh, but it's been great. And I really appreciate uh, everything you've done and Connor, it's been great. You know, Connor and I go back 20 years or so, something like that, since Connor was the lobbyist for the uh, VSEA. Always uh, working together, always, in my view, on on the right side of things. I'm glad you're moving on to something else where you're still going to be uh, a voice on the uh, on the right side, as I spend a lot of time in the legislature, and there are there are some there are a lot of members that are receptive to uh, to what I have to say, not sometimes not as many as I need. But and uh, and there are definitely other members that I know are always going to be allies, but uh, but there aren't that many members who uh, I know going into the body. They already know the fight for my clients. My clients' fight is their fight, and there are just a few who are really like that. And you're that's what you're going to be and. Uh, so it's been great. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I would echo all of that. It's um, you have both Anne and Connor served uh, the entire time I've been here. Um, and in fact, we're, I think, some of the first people I talked to about even thinking about running and really sold it. So thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's great. Um, um, but I just, you both really inspire me. Like you are values driven. You have bring a vision and just really incredible heart to this work. And you're just trying to make the community a better place and thinking creatively and, you know, how do we just show up every meeting and, you know, try to make our community better. And it just shows through and I love that you both have vision and values driving you and also roll up your sleeves and do the work and figure out like, okay, I'm going to come in with a policy. I'm going to work. I'm going to bring stakeholders together. And like, that's a rare combination to be able to not only be bringing creative ideas, a lot of passion, a lot of energy and kind of get in the details and make them happen then. So I'm just, I'm going to miss you. You guys are great. I got you some uh, legislature care packages. Um, some tums for the inevitable heartburn <laughs> it's filthy some you know white you've got headache medicine for all the headaches you're going to endure there's small stinky room gum you sometimes need to offer to people for the bumps and bruises along the way and when you can't decide how to vote some dice oh, perfect so wow. that is i hope perfect. these help you in your new roles and I look forward to working with you in them and we'll miss you here, but really excited for Vermont. They're going to be in the <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right. Going to go to Connor. All right. Uh, so I, I didn't write a speech because I, you know, I think I, I talk of the end in the hallway, you know, it, it, it feels a bit surreal, right? It's been like, uh, yeah, five, five years for me, longer for yourself there. Um, but yeah, really like coming into this, I, I was a political operative, you know, I always got other people elected and I was like, uh, oh, what a bunch of turkeys, you know, I could do that. Uh, so I decided to run, you know, and I think I realized it was, uh, uh, the, the dedication of an elected official, a local elected official was beyond what I ever thought it would entail there. Um, I, I really like, like, I'd always love this community, but I, I fell in love with this community by, by doing this job. And, you know, whether it be like, you know, some of these people we appoint to committees, you know, you look at like an art commission and uh, who's the applicant. It's, uh, you know, somebody who does, he's in charge of the statues in the Smithsonian, you know, <laughs> it's like, what incredible like talent we have here, you know, and, and just the dedication of people coming out to public meetings, you know, at the Elks Club or anything. It's it's such a dedicated community uh, with such like good, kind people in it who really want to do right by each other. You see that by the budgets passing. I mean, we ask a lot of people, but they give a lot in return, I think, too. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think, um, yeah, it's uh, got it's tough even talking, but it's 
it, it's such an incredible town. And I, I think like what, what I saw was that people I would walk past every day in this town, um, I, I started paying a bit more attention to them, you know, like going to Garden Park and like sitting down and, you know, people who were called like, you know, transients or something where people with like stories individually, every one of them. And, and it could have been like the domestic violence or something that they ended up there, but they were every bit like as proud to be part of our community as anybody else. Like, you know, just cleaning up and tidying up around Garden Park shelter. And um, I don't know, I've learned so much. I feel like I've taken more from the town than I, I've given really. Um, and I've always come from labor, but I, I don't think I really understood like, what being a frontline worker entailed until I saw some of the city staff. And I mean, it starts with Bill, you know, like it starts with Bill. If you like Montpelier, you have to like Bill Frazier, right? He's been here 25 years. So he must be doing something right. Right. It's uh, but uh, you know, in, in addition to being a great public servant, um, you know, Bill, Bill puts himself out there like, and you see him on front porch forum, taking a lot of hits for a lot of the decisions we make, you know, and he, and he does it gladly and he does it like with a lot of dignity. Um, I think that's why people respect him so much. So it's been a pleasure working with city staff, you know, Kelly, of course, it's been, it's been amazing having you Cameron. So it's, we, we've been so lucky there and every department, you know, spending some time, like going down the fire pole with Bob over there, you know, or go off-roading it with Alec in the park, you know, on the, the trails you didn't know you could drive on. Um, it was great. Yeah, you shouldn't have been driving there. It's uh, or uh, you know, doing ride-alongs with the cops, or seeing like DPW standing in like two feet of like water, you know, like, you know, like I, I remember Tom being like a drill sergeant when some of these pipes pipes broke and uh, barking orders at everybody. It, it, it's just been so incredible, and I, I think the biggest thing is like you guys have been like family. Yeah, you, you have. Like, there's no other way to say it. It's um, it's um, you know, every every time you come out to a meeting, you know, you might like disagree. It might be kind of a heated disagreement, but we, we leave it all here. You know, we do. There's been many times I've been the sole vote against or for something, you know, and I never felt like I was being singled out. I feel like, you know, we always like respected that we came from like a genuine good place. And, and that's it. That's a beautiful thing, I think. So, um, yeah. So it's been like uh, hits and misses along the way. It was fun. Like the first term, cutting a lot of ribbons and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, I I didn't mention electric scooters too much on the campaign trail. Uh, that was pretty fun. We had a hundred electric scooters in town. I remember being at the pub and the uh, guy comes in all battered and bloody, you know. Uh, I said, what happened to you, man? It's one of your scooters, dude. I said, what? He's like, well, I, I was having a pint. I was on the top of First Ave. It was raining and dark, you know. So I took a scooter down and like, God, I fishtailed on a pile of leaves, you know, and like flipped over the handlebar. I'm a bloody mess. And I said, Hey man, if I buy you uh pints the rest of the night, will you never tell anybody the story again? <laughs> so I thought that was a good deal anyways. But uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished together. I, uh, in many ways, I don't feel like I'm off the city council. I just feel like it's an extension to the state. I really do. Um, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> and I, I have no doubt we'll be seeing a lot of you, but, um, but yeah, no, I just want to thank everybody. Uh, thank everybody in the community and, and thank everybody here. I think it was the, uh, one of the best decisions I've made. And uh, I haven't said too much about ourselves because we're going to be spending a lot of quality time together. Uh, but the, 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 the way, you know, it's like the, my only problem with Ann Watson is she's not enough of a politician. She doesn't count votes. She actually believes that public, this course comes out with the right solution in a meeting. <laughs> and that's a, that's a very like, that's a rare leader. It is. It is. So I, uh, yeah, I can't wait to continue serving with you uh, across the street there. Um, so with that, um, thank you, everybody. I, uh, I resign. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can take my uh, reindeer and, uh, <laughs> my name tag yeah I'll, I'll are you even like right there. now and uh yeah okay. i have to resign well gosh i because i didn't i was gonna so you're gonna point yeah, fair enough are you are you like leaving leaving <laughs> no i'm gonna, I'm gonna hang out you're yeah. gonna hang out okay i've got a few public comments so. okay there you go there we go <laughs>
<laughs> I've got a lot of things I want to say to you people. <laughs> Thanks so much, okay. everybody. Okay, uh, super. Well, thank you. Oh, I'll I'll have more to to say uh, uh, to you on on your behalf there, Connor. Um, when we get to the mayor's report, uh, but thank you. Um, and with that, now that we have a vacancy uh, in District Two, uh, we are going to hear from some folks that are interested in that seat. Uh, so there are two applicants, and I know you're both here, um, and so you can go in any order. Uh, but we'd love to to hear from you if you would come up to the mic and introduce yourself and tell us about yourself and um, and your interest in serving on the city council. Yeah. yeah. All righty. So those are very huge shoes to fill. That um, yeah. So my name is Merrick Moden. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to speak with you all and to present the reasons why I should be Montpelier's next city councilor from District 2. So a little background on myself. I've grown up right here in Montpelier, and I live over on Sibley Avenue. I'm currently a senior at Montpelier High School, and I've long been drawn to the process of civic service and finding ways to solve problems. I'm an active and contributing member to various community organizations, notably as a student representative on the Montpelier Roxbury School Board and heading into my fourth year now as a member of the Montpelier Complete Streets Committee. So I'm coming from a bit of experience when it comes to the processes of civ civ civic government, um, local change and fielding community concerns. And I'm well prepared for the commitment that being a city council requires. And as many of you probably know, I ran in the primary over the summer to be one of Montpelier's state representatives. And I bring this up because it's an asset to already have pre-developed campaign skills heading into town meeting day. And, you know, knocking on, what is it, over a thousand doors over the summer has really allowed me to get to know this community. And I think that's a real big asset as well for the city council to consider when making their decisions. And that brings me to the very reason I stand before you all today. I'm passionate about change and helping this community improve and thrive. And along with that, I care really deeply about ensuring everyone feels represented and heard. I think having a diverse array of voices is crucial for the democratic decision-making process. Uh, in Montpelier, people under 34 account for roughly 40% of our overall community, and those from 15 to 34 account for approximately 23%. So from a disparity between what people make and what they can afford and the difficulties of staying in and starting out in Montpelier, a quarter of our city should be able to look to their council and feel that they're being represented by those facing the same issue and challenges that they are. So overall, from knocking on doors to uh, fielding community concerns to the Complete Streets Committee and holding listening sessions for the school board, um, I've quickly learned that resolving difficult conversations involves more than just communication. It requires translation, turning heartfelt ideas into coherent policy that results in meaningful action. And ultimately, this skill is what I offer to the council and to Montpelier now, to use my background experience as a voice and a guide to help, to help guide our community forward on, on so many issues that we're all concerned about and that we all care about and toward coherent policy and meaningful action. So. Thank you all, and I'm open to any questions, if you have any. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, so thank you, um, uh, by the way. Uh, so what is something that you feel like could be improved or a thing that you would like to advocate for or like a... a uh, like a policy level passion of yours? So, I mean, first and foremost, I would say the most important issue to me, and there are so many, but I think the most important issue to me is housing. You know, as as I'm, as you all know, we have a huge affordable, affordable housing crisis, both in Vermont and, and in Montpelier. And I really think that we need to be considering and really having more advocates as well for just affordable housing solutions. I know you've done such great strides and making great work towards that. But yeah. Yeah, cool. For Thank sure. you. Great. Other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Welcome. I have a 
one. Is it better now? I'm learning. <laughs> Closer. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Pelin Kohn, 292 Westwood Drive. I live in Montpelier. And tonight I will talk about my application for the City Council vacancy in District 2. But uh, first I want to thank to uh, two of my friends, Eva and uh, Dave. Uh, they, um, they were here to, uh, tonight and just talk uh, to support me. It, uh, it is very important for me because um, making friends um, after 40 years old is a little bit challenging. So I feel myself very lucky to have them. Uh, and also people uh, told me I will be uh, lucky when I moved here because in uh, 2017, I was driving uh, to our new house and with my husband. And there was a wild turkey waiting for me in front of uh, our back door. And a woman coming from Turkey, greeting with a turkey. <laughs> it's a really, really nice uh, incident. <laughs> then I start talking about it and all the people around me, is, do you know what? Wild or turkey generally means luck. So you will be very lucky here. And I feel I'm very lucky so far. There are some up and downs, but generally, I'm very happy that I'm living uh, here. And five years later, 2022, now I'm a woman from Turkey standing at the door of someone uh, because I decided to apply this um, uh, position and I had to collect signatures. And I was standing outside the door of one of my neighbors and my heart was beating so fast my legs were shaking my palms were like sweating and i just stood up and i said should i go back or just knock the door <laughs> maybe i should because they might have some cameras so they can see what is she doing here then i knocked and knocked 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 and i collected my signatures but um the scary experience turned out such a grateful experience for me because I talk so many different people and some of them uh, talk to me right some of them just oh yeah I will support you and just sign my uh, petition some of them uh, ask questions and some of them questioned me and some said our city needs to focus on infrastructure housing environment renewable energy taxes and I know that these represent our day-to-day -day issues as a community, and I believe that they are significant. And if I become part of the city council team, my commitment, dedication, and diverse background will play a key role in solving these issues. Some other people uh, said other things. They said our city must attract, retain, and include people from different races, ethnicities, and cultural background. According to a uh, 210 uh, census, uh, Montpelier and also Vermont as a state uh, had 6% of its population is minorities. People are from different races, different uh, cultural backgrounds. And in Sajak, we uh, work with creative discourse and according to their report now in 2020 after 12 years this number is three percent so what happened right we should maybe ask ourselves why and again when my neighbors community members uh talking about this issue they said probably these people are underrepresented in local offices public services and the representation of people like me is critical and represent representation can make a difference, not in the future, but today, right now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, yes. I can take that. Any questions? Um, I'm going to ask you the same question. I mean, you mentioned some of the issues that you heard from folks when you were knocking on doors. Uh, but is there any particular uh, 
topic or policy or improvement that you would be particularly interested in or passionate about um, for the city? Yeah, I try to talk about different things than DEI, but it is my passion. So I believe that um, our city and as a like a city uh, Montpelier, um, we should have DEI statement. It will be great. And uh, also in SAJEC, we are working on the uh, DEI declaration. Mm. Uh, so other towns have already passed. And it shows that what we feel and what we think about better community. So it is good. And also, I love to see some kind of international center in the city or recreation center. And just, you know, based on volunteerism and attract people like me from different cultures. Uh, they can come and uh, work and uh, they can show that they are not outsiders. They are part of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Any other uh, questions? Repellent. Okay. Super. Thank you. All right. So at this point, yes, Jack. So to 1 BSA section 313A3, I move we enter executive session to discuss the appointment of a public officer. Okay. Further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right. So we will go chat for a while and, and we'll be back. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. And, <clears throat> and opposed. All right. So we are back in public session. Uh, is there a motion? Go ahead, Jack. I move that we appoint Palin Cohn to the uh, vacancy of uh, vacancy of uh, Connor Casey. This is a very difficult decision for the council to make because we were uh, faced with two applicants who bring uh, very different uh, and and very impressive uh, attributes to this position. I think we could have done very well appointing. Either one of them, either uh, a new American who has come to Vermont, chosen to uh, to make this community her home, or uh, a young person who's never been uh, someone who's rarely seen in uh, in one of our elective offices, who's uh, lived in Montpelier all his life, and uh, I'm I'm glad that they both came to. Uh, <clears throat> to offer their uh, their dedication, their ideas, and their energy to the council, and I hope we'll you'll both stay stay involved. And so that's my motion. Hey, further discussion. All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right. Thank you, and thank you, Merrick, for putting yourself forward. We hope that you like continue. Um, as I, you're, you're such a wonderful um, energy and and passion. So there'll be two seats up for election in March. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> and and welcome, Fallon. Uh, we're delighted to uh, to have you. Um, so I think. Oh, well, actually, I yeah. Go ahead. The plan was that uh, the city clerk just wanted you to come by to get sworn in whenever you can between now and then. We'll do um, a formal. So what we usually do is just get sworn in as soon as you can at the clerk's office. Um, and then we'll do at the beginning of the next meeting, we'll do a ceremonial one. So if you want your family here and pictures and all that kind of stuff, we'll do one for, so. Great. Super. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so we are up to the mayor's report. Oh, gosh. Well, I've been thinking a lot about what I wanted to say um, as a part of my last council meeting with you all. Uh, and so I just have a, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is just, you know, as uh, you all move forward into making decisions for the future, I, I hope that you uh, all will just continue to keep a sustainability lens. And what I mean by that is not just environmental. I mean, of course, of course, I mean that. I mean, uh, adopting the net zero policy is one of my proudest um, moments for uh, the, my time 
on council. Uh, and it, I mean, it means like continuing to hear from um, the sustainability coordinator, uh, but it also to me means um, financial sustainability. So, you know, thinking about our steady state uh, plans for the roads and for, um, uh, you know, all of all of our infrastructure, as well as, you know, making it financially sustainable for uh, our, our population. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that I would just exhort uh, the, the council uh, do, you know, moving on into the future is to just always uh, at least start with the assumption that um, the staff is is doing their best, um, that I've found that to be true. Um, and, you know, if, if I have any good reputation, uh, it is at least like largely in part because of Bill uh, and his great work and the staff um, in general and the staff's great work. So I am really very grateful for um, for everybody's uh, work to make the city a really functional uh, place. So thank you to, to you, Bill. Thank you to the to the staff uh, in general. I've been very proud to work with you all. Um, and, and I also want to thank, thank you all, the council. Um, this has been a very functional group and I know that we have all been a part of not very functional groups in our lives. And so <laughs> it, I feel like it matters a lot that at this level where we are making decisions on behalf of the city, that this is a functional group. I love, I mean, Connor mentioned it, that we disagree well and uh, we respect each other when we disagree and that is welcome and okay. Um, and I, I really, I hope that continues as well uh, to make it a safe place to have honest conversation and, and to disagree. Um, and yeah, that, oh gosh, is I think most of what I wanted to say. I, um, I've spent the last 10 years of my life uh, coming to this space, Jack has been coming here longer, um, but just not necessarily on the city council. Um, but I, um, I have grown as a person, as a professional, um, and uh, yeah, just as a human in in this space. And because of the interactions I've had here, um, I would not be the person I am right now. Uh, without uh, being formed by by this um, body, this group. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful to, to, to you all, but also to all of the, the you know, previous counselors and um, uh, mayor and staff that I have formerly worked with as well. Um, yeah, it's hard to say goodbye. It's hard to let go, but it's time. And I'm really excited to be stepping into this new role, uh, serving, all of Washington County plus Stowe, Orange, and Braintree. Um, so please stay in touch. Uh, I'm sure that I will continue to have opinions about how things go, and I know how all of this works. So I will be back, I'm sure, with some opinions at some point. Yeah, but so grateful for all of you. You stay in touch. And with that, I will resign as mayor. So thank you. As of the end of this meeting. <laughs> Yay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Aw, you guys are going to make me cry. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> oh, uh, city clerk's reports. OK. Introduce yourself for everybody. Oh. Sorry. Yes, Sarah McMillan, I'm, I'm the new deputy city clerk. Um, I uh, moved here from Washington State, where I was a city clerk for about 17 years. Um, and uh, I love it here. It's beautiful. And everyone here is just so wonderful and nice. So, <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry. I forgot one thing. Connor. It has been a pleasure serving with you. So grateful for your opinions and your thoughts. Let's keep, let's keep, we have a lot to work on. I'm, I'm psyched to work together with you. Okay, done. So I wasn't thinking about this when we made the agenda that I get the last word tonight. <laughs> um, so first thing I will say to Anne and to Connie is that we have this little document that was unanimously passed 
by this group, including the two of you. This is our legislative agenda. And so um, you may see it again in an email or in my hand at the council or in someone's hand. So just remember that the, the unanimous vote is you two. <laughs> Good. Um, so there's that. Um, I'm also mad at myself, Mayor, and I will take care of this after the meeting. I was going to give you the key to the city, <laughs> but I forgot to bring it on. So we'll, but we will do that because I know that was one of your favorite things. Funny. You can't leave without a key to the city. I should go in the car and two of bottle openers. <laughs> um, it's been a pleasure working with both of you, I've, and uh, certainly with Ann for 10 years. Uh, I'd like to say, uh, you've already touched on it a little bit, but I, I, I speak for the staff, I know, that we have really appreciated the trust and faith that um, you as a group and you two in particular have shown toward our team and, and the assumption that we might be at least trying our best, even if we're not correct. And I think that support is deeply felt. Um, and secondly, uh, when I go... When I go to uh, meetings, you know, nationally or regionally, and people, because, you know, we have just city meetings, what do you together? What do you do? You compare what your city council, right? And I mean, that's just like any other job. And I sit there and say, you know, I got nothing to complain about. Our group is highly functional. They're highly respectful. They respect the staff. They respect the public. They, they disagree agreeably. I was just saying this to Sarah earlier tonight while we were waiting for the meeting to start. I said, she, you know, I said, you'll be surprised by this group, how, how they deport themselves. And it's just been an honor and a privilege to work that because as some of you, I've worked with councils that weren't as functional. And um, uh, oh, and the city clerk just arrived. Um, we're going to be taking an out the records request from now on, I learned earlier today. Uh, but that's a side story. Uh, no, it's it's really is an honor and a privilege. I, I told Ian, I won't tell the whole story, but uh, yesterday on the phone, I, uh, I'll just say, uh, 10 years ago, we had an appointment for council. And I'll oh, look at you, yours. You would make me look so good. That's all right. Here's the key of the city for the mayor. Wow. Yes. Well, oh gosh. Oh, there's two. Somebody, oh, you, you gotta send me these. I'm on it. You gotta send me these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. Good point. Good yeah, those are in the reserve fund. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, um, Bill. You're welcome. Yeah. So 10 years ago, we had a, a vacancy for District 2, and a, a, a local person who we all like a lot and has been very active in um, city government at the time was applying to fill it, and I think kind of a foregone conclusion that he was going to be appointed. And I'm in my office one day, and this young woman I've never seen before Bounces into my office, full of enthusiasm, sits down and says, "I'm going to, I'm going for this district two seat. I'm Ann Watson." I said, "Oh, nice to meet you." And we chatted for a bit. And anyone who's met Ann knows how nice she is and enthusiastic. And you know, it was very extremely pleasant conversation. And she walked out of my office and said, "That person knows nothing about local government." It's and true. They don't have, they don't have a chance of getting appointed to this seat. And uh, so she came in with an entourage of support and gave an impassioned plea. And they went off into executive session. And about, I don't know, an hour later, they came out and said, we're playing with Watson. <laughs> and it was the best decision the council ever made. But uh, I have learned since then never, ever, ever to doubt or question her. She's now Senator Watson. I'm sure she's going to be Governor Watson, U.S. Senator Watson. I did. The sky is the limit. So um, I, from that first day, it's been 10 very great years. You've been a huge supporter and I, you know, I personally appreciate it, but I know the staff does as well. And Connor, just great. Um, so thank you both for your service to the community. It's people like you that, uh, that make it worth working here. Thanks to Merrick and Pellin for 
stepping up, trying to be um, keeping good people on our board. We need people like that. And uh, look forward to working with you and hopefully with you too. <laughs> so uh, um, thanks. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Oh my gosh. This is it. Here we go. Um, so with that team, I'm going to use the gavel because I have never used the gavel. Um, with that, we will consider the meeting adjourned. Hey! <laughs>